I'm Armando Carbonell. I chair the Department of Planning and Urban Forum here at the Lincoln Institute. And uh, we're very pleased to be focusing on the nature side of our agenda uh, this uh, new time. Uh, as, uh, as regular visitors know, uh, our department's interested in cities and in nature, and nature and cities, and cities and nature. And I think this time we're going to tilt toward nature. Uh, we have recently uh, put out a policy focus report on large landscape conservation. We've been working on national policy uh, with partners like the Nature Conservancy, where uh, Jamie works. Uh, and we're very excited about some of the developments uh, that could be making uh, real some of the propositions that we've had out over a number of years, working uh, here with Jim Levitt, uh, who uh, deals with conservation matters for us uh, at the Lincoln Institute. I want to uh, talk a little bit about the Kingsbury Brown Fellowship because uh, Jamie Williams, who will be speaking to you, is the current uh, Kingsbury Brown, or just completing his Kingsbury Brown Fellowship. We actually have two running simultaneously. Uh, and for those who don't uh, know uh, who Kingsbury was, uh, he was a, a Boston lawyer who took a sabbatical from the firm of Hill and Barlow. Uh, and uh, back in 1980, came to be a fellow at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy uh, and also a visiting scholar at the Harvard Law School. And came up, uh, having visited a number of land trusts around the country, came up with the idea in 1982 that there be something called a land trust exchange. And that is the organization that uh, ultimately became the Land Trust Alliance with you know, thousands of members and huge influence uh, in the country. So we're very pleased that uh, the Lincoln Institute had, had a role in uh, making that movement uh, really grow and, and turn into the success that it has been. And we continue to have an interest in land conservation uh, uh, throughout. Now, uh, <coughs> Kingsbury Brown died a few years ago. And uh, uh, Gene Hawker, who had been a board member of the Lincoln Institute and also uh, former president of the Land Trust Alliance suggested it be uh, fitting to to remember Kingsbury, uh, and, and I knew Kingsbury, and uh, I'll tell you one little thing about him in a minute that anybody who knew him will, will certainly remember. Uh, but uh, I, I thought this is a great idea. There there was an award, and the award uh, includes a bronze eagle, right? And where did you put this? Gigantic uh, sculpture of a bronze ego. Have you got it at home or is it in the office? Or it's hidden away. What do you do with it? <laughs> so uh, I, was, uh, I was chatting with Rick and Wentworth at a meeting we had in Washington a little while ago, and he said, You know, it's, uh, we're, we're, we commissioned a number of these eagles and we're going to run out and we're kind of thinking well, what to do next. And somebody suggested that uh, they commission a sculpture of uh, Kingsbury Brown's. Eyebrows, which uh, I'd have to say you'd, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between that and the bronze eagle because they, they were truly of uh, eagle proportions. Uh, so that's, a, that's my memorable uh, note about Kingsbury. Uh, so uh, on, to, uh, on to Jamie. Uh, in addition to this eagle, uh, uh, <coughs> came up with the idea that there should be a fellowship where uh, we, we were able to. Uh, tap the experience of uh, people who were worthy of the Kingsbury Brown Award uh, and actually get them to share something that, uh, that they do value with the conservation community and do this through the Lincoln Institute. So uh, we've now done this for a number of years. We're very pleased that uh, Jamie has uh, been able to do a uh, Kingsbury Brown Fellowship. And uh, so here he is today, uh, Director of Landscape Conservation, how appropriate, at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, educated at Yale, started with uh, TNC back in 1992 in Colorado, uh, worked in Montana. He's going to talk about a place that uh, is of great interest to us, the crown of the continent, uh, depending on who you ask, something like uh, 10 million uh, acres uh, or more uh, of uh, a very intact ecosystem in, uh, in more than one state, more than one country. We'll get into this, but from the point of view of uh, the, the kind of stories that, uh, that he's uh, experienced over his time working uh, in, in the crown. So, uh, Jay Williams, please uh, come up and give us a talk. I think all of us 
realize that uh, so many of the threats we're trying to address are so urgent that we work so hard every day to try and have a bigger impact that it's, uh, it's very hard to take a breather and step back. And uh, that's been an enormous privilege here at the Lincoln Institute and that they've given me. And I've been part of a, quite a number of discussions uh, around large landscape conservation, how we protect entire landscapes, not just isolated properties, uh, in Washington, D.C. and with many foundations. And it's amazing, uh, you know, and in Montana and the Crown of the Continent, and almost no matter where you go, you find that, well, the Lincoln Institute is, is right behind all of that. And so the, they really uh, have been phenomenal in sort of moving this whole discussion along about how to get our work to scale, which is what we really need to do. So I. I, again, want to thank Armando and the Lincoln Institute for uh, your amazing work and, and support of practitioners like myself. So uh, this is actually what I want to focus on today, which is, uh, you know, how do we get our work to scale? I think we all wake up with this question about every morning, and, uh, and we have different answers to it uh, every day, but we're, we're learning a lot. You know, I think we've all come to realize that uh, we can't protect nature or wildlife or agricultural systems or open space uh, through isolated preserves or isolated conservation easements, that we need to be working to protect large uh, connected landscapes to really be successful. And it's great to be here in Boston because I think it was E.O. Wilson and Robert MacArthur who really first alerted us to this whole issue of scale with their theory of island biogeography in the 60s <laughs> that basically concluded or, or uh, observed that uh, bigger islands had more species than smaller islands and islands closer to the mainland had more species than those that were further away. And what we now find, of course, is the corollary, which is that fragmentation uh, is as is, is large places are fragmented into smaller and smaller islands, uh, the development and fragmentation have become the leading cause of species decline and ecosystem degradation. So this is, uh, this is the, what I'd really like to talk about here today um, based on my experience from Montana. Now it's not just biologists who have uh, called for the need to protect the entire landscapes. This is something we've been hearing from the ranching community for a long time. They have long said that if they don't have a continuous network of ranches, that they will not be able to survive economically because they won't have the community cooperation that they need uh, or the sort of critical mass of support services that their community needs to survive. So in every agricultural community that I've worked with in, in um, Montana and Colorado and other places, uh, you know, they've all uh, wanted us to move beyond our individual successes and really think about how we sustain these entire landscapes. Firefighters have alerted us to the increasing cost that wildfires is having on communities or in particularly on uh, rural development as they scatter out into the hinterlands. And uh, if we're going to lower the cost of fighting fires and allow a fire to burn in ecosystems that have evolved under frequent fire, uh, we've got to address this at the landscape scale uh, and address conservation at that scale. And of course, sportsmen uh, have been very concerned because even when large places are protected, uh, like the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area, it doesn't take much development to block access or to fragment the wildlife that depend on this place. So there certainly is an emerging consensus that we need to sort of move beyond isolated victories to efforts that protect entire landscapes. And as, as Armando said, what I want to talk about is uh, one of the largest intact uh, ecosystems, not just in North America, but truly uh, I think the globe for that matter, which is the crown of the continent and what communities have been doing there for decades now to protect this special place. The Crown of the Continent is a 10 million acre ecosystem and region that surrounds Glacier National Park uh, and Waterton, uh, actually the uh, Glacier Waterton International Peace Park that crosses the Canadian Montana border and the Bob Marshall Wilderness. It's uh, Host the just as an indicator of its biological health, it hosts the largest population of grizzly bears in the lower 48 states, and a population that actually is still connected to a contiguous population in Canada. But probably more importantly, as E.O. Wilson noted, 
this region hasn't lost a single species since European settlement. It's one of our best hopes for ecosystem resilience over the long term. Now, the reason why we have this opportunity in the Crown is because about 85 percent of the system is in public protected status thanks to 100 years of public land protection, starting with the establishment of Glacier National Park in 1910, just a century ago. But it's really the private lands that people have come to realize that are, will determine the fate of the system. These are the lands that are in uh, sort of brown that surround the system and intersect the system. It's these low elevation lands that are some of the most productive for the wildlife of the system that summering grizzlies and wintering elk depend on and for which wildlife need to connect uh, to these large protected areas within the system and beyond the system. And those private lands lie at the heart of some really remarkable <coughs> communities that are quite different from each other, but the one thing they share is an incredible commitment to protect this landscape in a way that's meaningful for them. So uh, what I'd like to do is just give a few highlights of some of the local community-based work that's going on, particularly on the Rocky Mountain front, on the east side of the Bob Marshall here, and then we're going to swing around to uh, the southern side of the Crown of the Continent, the Blackfoot River, and then uh, over here to the Swan Valley on the west side of the Bob Marshall, and uh, how the, their work uh, individually and collectively is, is really um, impressive and starting to add up to the protection of this entire system. So uh, just a little bit more on my background there. I've, uh, as Armando said, I've been the Montana State Director for 10 years, and then I've been working in a larger capacity with the Conservancy for the last three years, but still very focused on this system. So over the last 13 years, I've had just an you know, incredible opportunity to work with these communities on, uh, on the protection of this system. So starting on the Rocky Mountain front, you know, the Nature Conservancy started its work in this area in 1978, the old-fashioned way. We bought a nature preserve. That's what we were known for. That's what, you know, we used to do. Um, and this was uh, a Pine Butte Preserve that we purchased, was uh, considered one of the largest wetland fens south of the Canadian border, but also a really important place in the summertime for grizzlies descending out of the Bob Marshall to uh, rear their cubs in a a uh, very productive and hidden space there on the Rocky Mountain front. And as we worked to uh, uh, build this preserve over about 20 years to 18,000 acres, one of the largest in the Conservancy's history at that time, you know, we realized it was not hardly big enough to even protect a single grizzly bear we were trying to protect, because the home range of a grizzly bear, of a single bear, is 200 square miles, much less uh, trying to sustain an entire population of about 100 bears on the front and about six to 700 uh, grizzly bears in the crown on the continent. So we realized that we needed to turn our focus away from the preserve and towards our neighbors and towards the entire Rocky Mountain front. This is a mountain prairie <coughs> landscape that come together. It's a 200 mile landscape that extends from the Missouri River north up uh, uh, through the Blackfeet Reservation on the east side of Glacier National Park and up into Alberta. And so in the mid-90s, we really began talking to our neighbors. And what we learned is that uh, this community of ranchers uh, had generations of stewardship that had maintained the remarkable native prairie and wetlands that were there. And the reason why that this is some of the most legendary wildlife habitat in the lower 48 states. And that our question ought to be not how do we protect land from this community, but actually how do we help these people in their own effort to sustain the land in a way that works for them and for the wildlife that are there. And so right about that time as that dialogue was occurring, a, a group of landowners came together uh, and called themselves the Rocky Mountain Front Advisory Committee. as an informal group, collaborative group of landowners, ranchers up and down the front. And they, uh, you know, their vision was how do we stay, sustain this amazing place the way that we know it. And we started to support that effort uh, in the mid-90s, and they have been extremely active, uh, uh, meeting monthly here since that time, all the way uh, you know, right up to the present and going stronger and stronger every day. But one of the things that <coughs> they said to us early on is, you know, we want to focus on protecting this working landscape at the base of, of the mountains here. 
And we like conservation easements because they keep land in private <coughs> ownership and management. But uh, you know, being third, fourth, and fifth generation r ranchers, uh, a lot of these landowners uh, you know, couldn't realize um, the income tax benefits of donating easements, and in some cases were really um, you know, needed help in stabilizing their operations or wanted to expand their operations. And so they said, if there's any way you all could come up with funding to help purchase conservation easements, uh, that, that would make a really big difference. And that was something that we had not done uh, to this point, at least in the state of Montana. So we uh, did an initial project in, uh, in 1996 with the Delwell family, fifth generation ranching family. And uh, it was about a 6,000 acre ranch. And we did this with private money. It was a couple million dollars. It took us a few years to raise the funding. It wasn't easy. But you know, the one thing I think we all know in local communities is you know, words don't mean that much, but actions mean everything. And when we turned to, to actually you know, investing real private money into the local community, uh, into the sustainability of uh, an important economic operation, but also an incredible wildlife habitat, it's amazing uh, how that began to snowball and how the interest grew around with other landowners wanting to work with us who had not trusted us in the past, but who wanted to uh, also consider conservation easements for their properties. The only problem that we had was that um, we didn't believe we were going to be able to raise the kind of funding that was going to be needed to do this. So we had a real crisis of opportunity, as we called it, with landowners wanting to do a lot of great work, but us not having the funding to do it. So the advisory committee discussed um, for quite some time, how, how do we really uh, create a program here that's not just going to work for one or two ranchers, but that actually could really um, tie all these ranches together into a larger vision. And they put together a really bold vision of trying to protect 250,000 acres along the Rocky Mountain front, basically the lands in gray uh, that are within this boundary, and what you see in red is just our initial preserve, Pine Butte Preserve. And what everyone agreed is that the only way this would work is if we were able to leverage private and public funding. So the Cowboys all ran off to Washington, D.C. and started talking to the delegation and to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about how uh, a program <coughs> might be created here that could use federal funds to purchase conservation easements. And in the end, what was established was a new unit of the National uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, called the Rocky Mountain Front Conservation Area. But unlike new refu refugees, uh, refugees that are established, this unit of the Fish and Wildlife Service was only authorized to purchase conservation easements on working lands. Um, and it was one of the <coughs> first to be able to do that uh, in the nation. Actually, the first was the Blackfoot River that had pioneered this tool, which I'll talk about in a minute, just around the corner. But the Rocky Mountain Front took it to a new scale. And what was great about that is once that vision and program was in place, while we had a lot of trouble raising that $2 million for that first conservation easement, all of a sudden we had a real coalescence, a coalescence of state agencies and of private donors that really stepped up and said that they would put serious funding into this if uh, the federal government could put serious money into this. And then we had a sort of newer um, uh, landowners that had bought property that were uh, able and willing to donate conservation easements. So when you take all of those different contributions together, the vision was to be able to protect a 250,000 acre landscape for $100 million of private and public funding. And so over the 15 years, uh, that group has made uh, amazing efforts. Other conservation groups came in, the Conservation Fund in particular, the Montana Land Reliance was involved, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and you know, different landowners uh, you know, had different fits with different organizations, but everyone is working together to achieve this vision that the landowners created. And now, uh, some 15, 16 years later, 161,000 acres of ranch lands have been placed into conservation easements and the remainder uh, or the momentum is really there for the missing pieces here to come together once funding is available. So that's, uh, th that's uh, a few words about the Rocky Mountain Front. One additional piece on the Rocky Mountain Front I would just add is that this green, uh, this is the Bob Marshall Wilderness, the dark 
green lands, but the light green are actually Forest Service lands that aren't in wilderness status. And as all this private land work started to gain momentum, what the ranchers realized is a lot of this could be undermined by mineral development, oil and gas development uh, into this really wild land, but uh, not necessarily protected by designations. So they were also successful in lobbying Congress to pass special legislation to withdraw the mineral rights along that uh, margin of public lands that was so key to their private lands. So it truly, was a, 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 it truly is a public and private land effort uh, with landowner local leadership. So now I want to turn our attention and come to the southern end of the Crown of the Continent, to the Blackfoot River. And, you know, outside of uh, Glacier National Park, the Blackfoot is probably the most well-known national landscape within the Crown. It was made famous by Norman McLean's the River Runs Through It, his book, and then the movie that followed that book. But I think what's really become uh, most significant about the Blackfoot is actually the depth and breadth of collaboration that has occurred there over 35 years now, uh, led by local landowners to protect this watershed. And uh, what they have accomplished is truly staggering. And uh, I can only touch on a, on a few things here. But it was really initiated by uh, local landowners and ranchers in the 1970s. And uh, ironically enough, they were motivated by the threat of a federal wild and scenic designation of the Farmington River, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Blackfoot River. We were just talking about the Farmington River earlier. And, uh, and it, was, it was that, um, and it was just an idea that was put out there, but it was that idea that uh, concerned the community that, you know, what might happen to them and what would that mean, and that they wanted to control their own destiny. So a group of landowners came together and said, you know, we can protect this river ourselves. And so they started doing conservation easements on the Blackfoot River in the early, or in the mid-70s. And actually, they were the ones that pioneered the uh, legislation, the <coughs> conservation easement legislation in the state of Montana, and uh, did the first conservation easement in the state. And then ultimately, uh, in addition to donated conservation easements, uh, created the prototype for this Fish and Wildlife Service uh, public uh, funding program <coughs> for conservation easements. This is Jim and Colleen Stone and their son Brady, and uh, they uh, were among those landowners that uh, led those efforts over about 15 years. But what Jim uh, ultimately did is uh, he <coughs> helped put together or formalize that collaboration into a group called the Blackfoot Challenge and in 1993. And this is a landowner group of uh, local ranchers, of federal and state agencies, conservation groups, the timber company that's there. And their focus is on how to protect uh, this entire watershed and the rural landscape and the natural values that are there through communication and cooperation. And it, it, what this group has achieved uh, is amazing. They collaborate with about 200 landowners uh, 20 different agencies, uh, about 20 conservation groups, and over 30 businesses in the valley. And I think, you know, Jim Stone really, uh, you know, anytime you achieve any kind of project with Jim Stone, you know, he's never that happy because he, uh, you know, ultimately what he's interested in is in protecting the entire watershed. And he said, you know, until we get to that place of, <coughs> of sustaining this landscape ridge to ridge, uh, you know, I'm not going to rest. And he's been working all of his life lifetime towards that goal. Now, what I'd like to highlight here is not necessarily their conservation easement program, which also has been very similar to the fronts and very successful, but, um, but is actually on the recovery of this river. And the interesting thing about the movie, A River Runs Through It, is that it actually wasn't filmed. Even though it was about the Blackfoot River, it wasn't filmed in the Blackfoot. Um, because this was a river that uh, had some real problems uh, with a lot of mining in its headwaters and contamination. And it really was a fishery in recovery. And the Blackfoot Challenge and, uh, partnered with Trout Unlimited early on, uh, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the state of Montana, to start working on win-win voluntary projects with landowners to figure out how to start improving uh, this river system and the tributaries. As Jim Stone said, you know, he doesn't consider his ranch healthy unless the river is healthy because they're all connected. And 
And the quality of the river is a reflection on the quality of his management. And that's the kind of ethic that these landowners have in the Blackfoot. So I'm just going to highlight one project here, um, but then I'll talk a little bit about their broader accomplishments. And this project, uh, I particularly want to highlight because it involves some investors from Boston who, who came in and helped uh, purchase a ranch that um, was actually one of the biggest problems uh, in the Blackfoot. Um, this is Nevada Spring Creek. It's only at about a four-mile creek. It comes right out of a hill at 10 CFS cubic feet per second consistently year-round at 46 degrees, which is a great cold temperature for cold water trout uh, species. But by the time it hit the Blackfoot River four miles later, it was an inch deep and, you know, um, the proverbial mile wide. And uh, the temperatures were as high as 80 degrees when it was hitting the Blackfoot River. So it, was, it, was not, it had not only become, uh, instead of a trout stream, sort of a warm water sucker stream, but it was also creating a huge problem for the Blackfoot River as a whole. And so we were asked to sort of step in and do something about this. And in 2002, um, Frank Potts, who owned this property, uh, passed away, and his estate offered the property to us to purchase if we could do it in 30 days. And it's about 1,300 acres. So we stepped in very quickly and purchased the property. And then the Montana Land Reliance um, brought in uh, a man of the name of Fred Danforth, who maybe some people know in this audience, who <coughs> lives here in Boston as a banker and uh, who's, who uh, was segueing out of sort of banking into, uh, into conservation banking and, and has now created a private investment firm called the Ecosystem Investment Partners that is focused on restoration. But at that time, uh, he had loved Montana, spent a lot of time fishing there, and the Land Reliance uh, showed him this opportunity. And what we were looking for was not just a buyer that would purchase a property and conserve it with a conservation easement, but someone that would really aggressively uh, go after the restoration of the stream with real expertise, and that they really did. So they purchased this property, they placed an easement on it with a donated one to the Montana Land Reliance. And then they went about um, restoring the stream. And within a year, a year and a half of their work, uh, they were able to um, um, return this channel to uh, a deep, uh, narrow, cold water channel and uh, reduce the temperature by 17 degrees, the maximum temperature as it hits the Blackfoot River, and uh, recreate more of the habitat that existed there. And the proof of the pudding uh, was in that same year, a 25-inch brown trout was caught in that river. But also, uh, as they sampled, um, you know, huge uh, populations of native bull trout and uh, cutthroat trout were inhabiting the stream. So this is, uh, you know, just one example of one of the projects that has been taken on the Blackfoot that shows what private and public partners can do together. Now imagine this. There's actually... Uh, 680 of those projects that have been done in this watershed over 20 years, with 200 landowners opening up passage for fish um, by removing barriers to 600 miles of tributary streams, res restoring riparian habitat on 41 of those streams, and uh, through annual monitoring have showed over this 20-year period an 800% increase in the uh, native fish populations of this basin. So it, it is truly an amazing story that has been landowner by landowner um, through win-win uh, uh, work that's been beneficial for both conservation and for the uh, landowners of this area. So the, uh, the Blackfoot also instituted a program of conservation easements. And um, you know, after 30 years of this work, they had protected about 120,000 acres of ranch lands and conservation easements. But in 2002, they really came to a crossroads, which after all this great work on the fishery, after all this great work in pre protecting ranch lands, most of the white land you're now looking at in here, the private land was owned by one owner, which was an industrial forest company, that um, one of the largest in the country, that was starting to look at this land uh, less for trees and more for development as the as the Blackfoot and other places around the West were being discovered. And their concern was that, uh, you know, 30 years of great conservation work could be unraveled if all of this surrounding, uh, sort of the ring around the bathtub were developed. Because what it would do is it would sever 
the, uh, the green land, the, you know, the public land that goes right up into the Bob Marshall Wilderness from this protected river land uh, down in the bottom. And initially, we had looked at trying to do a small purchase in the upper part of this area. And uh, the Blackfoot Challenge said, no, you know, we, we really need to think about this problem, you know, on a watershed basis. And we need to think about uh, trying to do a comprehensive project with this company to really protect this system. So uh, this was a challenge unlike any other that the challenge had ever faced. And what Jim Stone and the challenge said you know, that it had to be done is nothing could be attempted of this scale uh, without um, talking to you know, the neighborhoods throughout the valley because as representative as the Blackfoot Challenge was, they felt like they really couldn't represent such a broad, diverse valley. It's about a one and a half million acre watershed, about an 80 mile river. So a series of 14 different meetings were held in each little neighborhood around this valley to really understand what people wanted, where the land should go, what values should be maintained. And the net conclusion of all of that was that uh, it was a very detailed plan of what lands were important to protect, which was informed by biology and by community, and, uh, and what should happen to it. And what, you know, the net net is that um, folks wanted most of the land to go into public ownership, to be open to the public for continued public access for sportsmen uh, and sportswomen, and also for grazing and sustainable forestry. Now, this was kind of a surprise for me because I'd worked with a lot of ranching communities uh, around the West. And the whole notion that uh, they would be supportive of a lot of land going into public ownership, you know, just didn't seem right to me. So, uh, and it really challenged my, I thought I was great at community-based conservation, but this was really challenging my preconceived notions uh, based on experience. And I needed to step back and just really listen. And then they said, no, this is, this is what works for this community. This is what we want. The, the industrial timberland has been open to the public in the past. So in some ways, it's been considered semi-public, and you know, they really want to maintain it the way that it is. And the company, uh, because this land in particular was on the fringe of their operations, uh, wanted to sell a lot of this land, did not just want to do a conservation easement. So, um, so again, we said, well, this can't all be done with private funding. And while private funding will be an important piece of this, uh, we're going to have to involve our public officials. So. Uh, this is Jim Stone's porch in the Blackfoot River Valley, and he's talking to Senator Conrad Burns, who was our Republican senator at the time. Who, uh, and so, you know, he was famous for not liking public land acquisition. But after meeting with these landowners and understanding how genuine uh, their interest was, and how well informed it was, and how homegrown the project was, he said, "You know, I don't." I don't like land going into public ownership, but this is your community, your plan, and if this is what you want, I'll work to support you. And uh, he said, what do you need? And Jim Stone, who doesn't uh, you know, like asking for money, you know, finally coughed out, well, it's, you know, we really need about $40 million in public funding. And uh, Senator Burns took a little uh, uh, card out of his pocket and wrote that down and put it in. And he said, I don't know if I can do it, but I'll try. Well. He was able to deliver the full $40 million. And since that time, uh, Senator Baucus and Tester and our governor uh, have built on that early success and helped the Blackfoot Challenge do additional forest conservation projects. And so over the last eight to nine years now, the, uh, the Blackfoot Challenge has been successful in um, securing about 170,000 acres of land uh, for the community and for conservation. Uh, that ties together the 30 years of conservation easement work to public lands in a true, you know, connected landscape. Can you Plum well, the Plum Creek, so this is the company we're talking about is Plum Creek. So all the dark green that you're seeing are, is 173,000 acres of land that was formerly owned by Plum Creek uh, that was purchased and, um, and then it, since that time, it's been resold to either federal or state agencies. In some cases, sold to local ranchers with conservation easements. And um, there's still, uh, on the western side of this map, there's still some continued ownership by Plum Creek in this block and in this block right there. Um, the rest of this is uh, private ranch land, basically. So. 
that's a, a quick snapshot of the Blackfoot River Valley. Now I want to swing around to the Swan Valley on the western side of the Bob Marshall, which is a very different place. We call it the wet side, the dark side. This is more like the Pacific Northwest, where the Rocky Mountain front gets anywhere from six to eight inches of rain a year. You can get as much as 40 inches of rain in the Swan. It's a very wet, forested valley. And, um, you know, where the industrial uh, sort of forest lands, you know, selling into development was one of the problems that Blackfoot faced. In this particular case, it was, it was really the problem that the Swan faced because the land in the Swan Valley was entire, almost entirely owned um, by either the U.S. Forest Service or by Plum Creek Timber Company in this checkerboarded fashion that was left over from the railroad grants of the 19th century. And, you know, all of that was okay for a time as, as it was being managed as working forest. But once um, these lands and this valley uh, became, you know, because of its incredible scenic uh, beauty and, and uh, wetness, um, land started selling for upwards of $10,000 an acre there. Not for just small house lots, but entire 640-acre sections of land. So, you know, where the, plum, where the Blackfoot folks, you know, ultimately had to marshal together about $100 million for the kind of work they were talking about. This was a $500 million problem if you looked at all the lands. And that just seemed staggering and beyond what anybody could ever do. And so what the local community, uh, led by Melanie Parker, who runs one of the local nonprofits, uh, Northwest Connections, and she's also on the board of the Sw Swan Ecosystem Center, and she's really <coughs> been one of the key community leaders in bringing that community together. What they did for about 10 years was they actually acquired the most important of those Plum Creek sections. It's about 7,000 acres over 10 years for about $70 million um, with uh, the help of the Trust for Public Land. And as great as all that work was, what they realized is that the bears were telling them that a piecemeal solution wasn't going to succeed in the end, that the swan wasn't just a place where grizzly bears walked through to get to the other side from the Bob Marshall Wilderness here on the right over to the Mission Mountain Wilderness here on the left. But they, uh, the swan with over 4,000 wetlands was core habitat for this population of bears that would go up and down the river. And yes, they connected these landscapes, but, uh, but the Swan Valley was critical core habitat, not only for grizzly bears, but a whole variety of other wildlife. And so the only solution that would work would be a comprehensive solution. So, uh, but it was unlike anything we had seen before. And in the Blackfoot, we had used traditional sources of funding uh, to achieve the work there. In this particular case, uh, everything was going to have to be untraditional to make it work. And so the local community groups, including the challenge and uh, the groups in the Swan and the Clearwater, uh, the congressional delegation, Governor Schweitzer, um, and uh, a whole group of funders uh, and conservation groups ranging from the Wilderness Society to the Nature Conservancy to the Trust for Public Land all came together to see how to solve this issue, not only for the Swan, but really for this region. Um, and ultimately came up with a, a project to protect about 310,000 acres of Plum Creek land in the Swan, the Clearwater, the Blackfoot, uh, as well as some of these areas to the west that are important for linking the crown and the continent to the Salmon Selway system in Idaho. And uh, the state of Montana has now put about 70, 70 million dollars into this effort, which is unprecedented for them. And uh, uh, Senator Baucus and his colleagues had to create something out of whole cloth to put 250 million of federal money into it, and we're about 80 percent of the way there on this project. So this is the result of that project for the Swan Valley, re that ecosystem back together and that landscape, the <coughs> challenge that we all thought would be the most intractable. But because everybody came together in a collaborative fashion, committed themselves to the goal, looks like we are going to succeed. So what I want to just say a few words about now is uh, you know, we've talked about individual efforts in each of these three landscapes, but what's really compelling to me is the synergy between these landscapes. And as these local collaborative efforts were working in each of their own ways, there was an increasing amount of collaboration and communication among these landscapes. And it, that has really had a big impact on the successes that I've talked about. The, um, 
This is uh, a recent effort that um, there's new legislation that passed several years ago to restore public forest called the Collaborative Landscape Forest Restoration Act. Uh, and it is focused on 10 pilot projects where federal money will go to help restore forest that because of fire, century of fire suppression are out of whack uh, and need other kinds of treatments like a restoration of uh, rivers and other things to, to really restore these systems to a fire adaptive status. And, the black, and what you see here is a successful uh, proposal by the Blackfoot Challenge in the Clearwater Valley and the Swan Valley uh, to um, be one of these pilot areas over the next 10 years to restore public forest uh, over this system that will complement so much of the private land that has been, uh, private land work that has been done. The Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, uh, particularly on the R Rocky Mountain front, or initially so, was really instrumental in reducing the conflicts, uh, grizzly bear conflicts with ranchers. One of the things they do is they relocate dead cow carcasses shortly after they die into remote places so that bears don't start associating dead cows with the live ones and start eating a lot of cows. And this program has had an amazing impact in, uh, in reducing um, livestock kill. And it's really increased the tolerance for, uh, from local landowners of grizzly bears in this system. And that program has been expanded to the Blackfoot and to the Swan Valley. What we have in the Crown is not just a static population of grizzly, grizzly bears, it's an expanding population. In the Blackfoot River Valley, where they're loaded up with bears now that, you know, when I started working there 13 years ago, they didn't have grizzly bears in the Blackfoot. But this population has been expanding and the community acceptance has allowed for that because of this kind of program that has occurred over all three landscapes. And the conservation easement program that was pioneered in the Blackfoot, of course, has expanded to all of the landscapes and is now something that um, is being expanded to other landscapes around the country. The Fish and Wildlife Service program using federal funding uh, to buy working land and working ranch conservation easements. But let's take it up another scale because the Crown alone, uh, if we were just successful in doing all this great conservation and work in the Crown, would we be successful? And I think the answer probably is no, that in fact the crown is connected to a much larger system of wildlife in the Northern Rockies, in Canada. Um, and you know, historically, those wildlife populations were also connected to, whoops, to um, the Salmon Selway and to the Greater Yellowstone, where there are also big populations of similar wildlife. And so the land trust community came together in a collaboration called the Heart of the Rockies throughout this whole region, including land trust in Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, and Canada, on how we can work together more successfully around our common priorities. And that effort has really increased uh, our impact in protecting really important areas that have uh, even a broader significance than the local significance. And in fact, I don't think the Montana Legacy Project and some of the other large work that we just talked about would have occurred without this larger context and recognition of how significant these landscapes were, not only in of themselves, but for creating larger linkage. And particularly in a climate changing context, the need to protect large areas and connect them uh, is paramount if they're going to be resilient over the long term. So this, uh, and this again was, uh, you know, a, a real area of hope that was noted by E.O. Wilson in his book, The Future of Life. And he looked at Glacier and the larger Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative, which this is all a part of, and said, you know, this might be one of the few places where we can connect large areas for the benefit of wide-ranging wildlife. So in closing, I just have a, a few sort of final words I would like to say. The, um, you know, there's a lot of themes that run through all of this work, but the, I think the most important theme is that for so long, uh, you know, we were all sort of cowboying out on our own to try and do conservation. And uh, what ranchers have come to realize, what conservation <coughs> groups have come to realize, what state and federal agencies have come to realize is that, you know, we're not going to be successful at larger scales if we don't work together. And it's really been encouraging to see how collaborative <coughs> groups are coming together, not just in the West, but throughout the country, to try and sustain larger places, not just for nature, but for community uh, and economic values as well. And that that is uh, probably the most important theme that, that has made uh, the work in the Crown of the Continent successful. 
But the other big one was that, you know, in the land trust community, uh, and with my experience for a long time, I, I think there was a resistance to uh, partner with public agencies at any real scale. There was a feeling of, you know, we, we work uh, it's conservation through private action. We pride ourselves on being able to uh, work in the private sector to conserve land. And we have all been successful for that reason. But if we're ultimately going to connect these properties and if we're going to get to scale and solve uh, a lot of the problems that these landscapes have, it really requires private and public solutions and public funding. And it's why uh, a lot of the budget cuts that are going on right now in Congress uh, are really concerning to us because now that there's so much momentum behind these collaborative efforts, if they lose their uh, state and federal partners and the, their expertise and their funding, uh, it's really going to be a setback to a lot of collaborative efforts and the need to sustain these funding sources are, are really pivotal to seeing this work succeed. But the final point I would make is that you know, none of these uh, efforts happen overnight. That, uh, the work that I just talked about in the Crown of the Continent has been going on for 30 and 40 years. And my involvement of it, with it has been just a small piece of it, standing on the shoulders of people that have been working for decades in this landscape. And you know, it all starts with relationships, with trust, with small successes, and those successes eventually can build to bigger projects. So as organizations, we, we really need to commit to places. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk around large landscape conservation right now, but uh, if we don't commit to the long term to places, it's going to be very difficult to get to scale in these places. So, you know, the great thing uh, is that the land trust community, over 1,700 land trusts, uh, have achieved amazing success, protected over 37 million acres uh, over its history now. And, you know, that gives, uh, we've got the relationships uh, to really start dreaming about being able to achieve this kind of work in many places to protect entire watersheds, entire landscapes. But we can only do that if we double up our efforts to work together around common priorities. And if we do that, I think we can succeed in this endeavor to conserve really special places for future generations around the country. So thank you. As part of his fellowship, Jamie has written a working paper, which will soon be available on our website, which goes into some of the, the very same stories, if you need references uh, on it. Uh, he's also participated in meetings we've had in Washington, at Library of Congress, with other folks who are working on the America's Great Outdoors Initiative. And uh, we're looking forward to having uh, Jamie participate at the uh, Land Trust Alliance rally in the fall as, uh, as part of his uh, duties as, uh, as a Kingsbury Round Fellow as well. So uh, very pleased to be uh, associated with Jamie. So we're interested in large landscapes, and uh, as you can see from the maps, these are truly large areas, and I, I think they're so big that people uh, probably have a, a hard time imagining that they're really part of them, that, 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 that we don't really inhabit places of 10 million acres. You know, we, we inhabit these smaller units, and because we're about to launch a network of practitioners of uh, large landscape conservation here in May at the at the uh, Lincoln Institute. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, because it, it seems to me that the trick here is to bring together people who truly do feel that they are part of a landscape, and then build those units into the, you know, sort of the larger strategic vision, which, which seems very important based on your presentation. So I, I guess this question, do you buy that, that, uh, that it's really something a little smaller than the large landscape that's the operational unit, but that needs to be kind of coordinated and, you know, people need to learn from each other and, and have, have big goals that extend beyond the boundaries of their individual uh, initiatives and projects, uh, but that likely you're not going to get that kind of commitment and, and feeling of belonging if you can't relate it to something a little smaller than the truly big landscape. So. So these communities didn't come together 30 years ago around the crown of the continent and say, we need to protect this 10 million acre ecosystem, let's all work together. That's a huge system. And even trying to get landowners together around that system now, uh, as you all know well here at the Lincoln Institute, is very difficult. I mean, it's, uh, it's 200 miles on each side of that system. And uh, you know it's about 100 miles across. 
So the, uh, and I talked about three of the communities, there's additional communities. So the Rocky Mountain Front is a large place in itself, but they identify with themselves as a community. They can, they can uh, you know, get to a meeting within an hour drive. Um, that's, you know, they, they, that's a community that comes together in a lot of other ways already. So the Blackfoot is the same, the uh, Swan, you know, similar. The Flathead is a whole other place, which is on the northern side of this that I didn't talk about, but there's a lot of work up there. So, no, I think these, um, I think these efforts need to happen I at the scale at which people identify with landscape. And uh, th that's a smaller scale than the 10 million acre crown of the continent. But over time, what you find is that these groups will want to understand the larger connection and, and that they were empowered by the notion that, hey, what we're doing here is great and uh, it's part of this larger thing and it's great that uh, other groups are working uh, in their ways in other places that connect to what we're doing. And so just in the way that the wildlife connected those landscapes, the people started, they did start to connect with each other, but that only came later in time. And uh, I think to start an effort at that scale would be too big a scale. Um, it, it really has grown up organically into that scale. I'd just like to take a slightly different slice at, at your question and Jamie's response, which is, it seems to me, Jamie, what you've been working with are overlapping resources. And you're essentially identifying groups to which one or another of the resources are important. For example, in the Blackfoot, the ranchers are concerned primarily about the agricultural base as a resource, whereas you know those of us who are more concerned about wildlife are concerned about the wildlife resource and how it interfaces with that agricultural base. So you know where you start identifying a larger landscape, I think Armando is when you start looking at how do these different resource uses and resource priorities overlap in a way that makes sense. For instance, you're talking about Jim Stone wanting to protect the entire watershed. Well, 40 years ago, they would have been concerned strictly about the river frontage, perhaps, not about the watershed that drained into that river frontage. So uh, when I look at stuff like this, I look at the competing resource use and how you weave that together. Uh, not so much as how do you make everybody think about the gigantic overall landscape. Because it's only if you're thinking about bears or wolves or you know, mostly large predators or large underlets wandering across the landscape that you really th start thinking on the 200 square mile and up um, scale. Well, I think that <coughs> has been the success of these efforts is the, they didn't start out thinking how do we protect the whole watershed just like you said. They started thinking about, well, how do we, uh, they, how do we work together given the competing interests that exist for wildlife, for agriculture, and, uh, and that was you know, the genius of the Blackfoot Challenge, I think, because they started coming up with truly you know, win-win ways to protect fish, but in a way that sustains the water for the ranchers that they needed for irrigation. Um, they uh, uh, figured out ways to uh, have grizzly bears expand into the valley, but in a way that would uh, keep the conflicts down. Um, so. And there's a myriad of those examples. Uh, you know, every project that they take on, they're trying to achieve those, you know, find creative ways to achieve those multiple interests. And because they've been able to do that, they've been able to go to scale. So I, I think you're right about that. It's, uh, you know, they found creative solutions to these overlapping uses that can benefit both. And, uh, and they replicate very quickly because they're good solutions. Um, um, Oh. I probably tried to shoot you. <laughs> at some point. So, thank you. I knew you were familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I was just wondering. Well, first a quick thought about scale and thinking that now might now is a time in which my generation still has been told the myth of the larger ranch, and the, by my grandmother and my great grandmother, and the connectivity or at least the myth of connectivity of larger landscapes. Um, before things got pared down, there used to be open range. So the time of memory now in the West is rapidly shrinking, <laughs> at least in the part that I know. Um, and also, so, so that might be something to think about, the way that gen different generations perceive their own scale um, of resources or of use. 
Um, and then secondly, I had a question if you could speak more about mineral rights and how you're connecting those in, especially um, as I know a lot of natural gas exploration is starting to really grow in the Rockies. And last, but not least, uh, well, two. <laughs> two. <laughs> um, I think you're incredibly modest when you talk about communities and showing pictures of ranchers together is not something easy. Um, and showing them with a public official <laughs> talking about federal land, maybe he's in Montana, but that, those people are, are you know, on one end of the spectrum, <laughs> I think. Uh, um, and so I, 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 I'd appreciate just some of your reflections on how you personally, um, your strategies in gathering changing the way that people approach their own resources, whether it be through describing quantification of land values, you know, the future, present value, whatever, or um, the, the possibilities of collaboration, and how you manage to stay sane in that. Uh, you know, I started my work in the Yampa River Valley, where, um, where the Carpenter Ranch is, the, the, your family's ranch is, and um, you know, that's really where I sort of cut my teeth in working with the ranching community and Roz Garcia uh, and I became, she, you know, she didn't want to have anything to do with the Nature Conservancy and, uh, you know, so she, she was a good test case for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but we became really good friends and, um, you know, it just, it was a lot of listening and really, um, I think it takes a lot of humility on anyone's part to you know, I was new in that valley, and uh, so I think it's, it's, you know, the importance of listening and learning from local wisdom is, is just really critical, and I think ultimately that was really key in how I was able to work with ranchers there in the Yampa, Ros Garcia at the Carpenter Ranch initially, um, but then a broader group of, of landowners there, and uh, because we realized that, you know, we had to learn from them about how to s sustain this place, and once they really believe that, uh, we were able to then implement programs that would benefit ranching uh, as well. So, um, you know, and there was a lot of people in that community that didn't want to, I mean, the, the, the uh, cattlemen's, cattlewomen's, you know, they, they, the, there was a big wise use conference that had just happened in the Yampa Valley right before we started our work, and the Nature Conservancy was hung in effigy. So, you know, there was a lot of work to, to start there, and, and it was really about going slow and taking the time. We ended up in this Rocky Mountain Front Committee I was talking about, in many ways, was kind of patterned after this Yampa Committee of ranchers that was put together. And there had been a lot of visioning exercises in the Yampa Valley, but they were usually urban-oriented. They were coming out of steamboat. So this is one of the first, it was a landowner group, um, and they were starting to work about how they would conserve the Yampa, and uh, it was controlled by them. And so when they were, were in control, and groups like ours were only there to support them when they wanted us, it, it gave them a sense of power and ability to work with us, and then we were, we were able to do a lot of things there as and in these other landscapes. So I think that's really key. The question is scale. The, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we've been purchasing conservation easements is because what landowners have been doing, you know, people think, oh, they're just putting away debt, and but actually what a lot of these ranchers on the Rocky Mountain Front have done is they've actually bought uh, additional land because over time their ranches have been whittled down um, because they've had to sell land for one reason or another. And actually this program is allowing them to actually whittle back up and uh, to get to a scale that makes economic sense. And, and uh, so that's, that's why it's had a huge economic benefit as well as a conservation benefit in, in doing the purchasing conservation easements. And then the piece about mineral rights, um, you know, it is really challenging. The, uh, in the crown of the continent, it's one of the few places I think we've succeeded, the community has succeeded in uh, getting rights uh, purchased out and then withdrawn from mineral leasing. And, but the reason for that has been really twofold, or maybe threefold. One is because of community wants those uh, mineral rights removed. I mean, it's ranchers that are lobbying to have this ha happen. Two, private entities have been coming, willing to come in and actually pay, compensate the existing leaseholders for their damages, which, um, you know, otherwise they would have sued and it would have been a huge mess. And then I think the third reason is that the, cr the mineral rights in the Crown, you know, aren't as significant as a lot of places. And, you know, where they're really super significant, that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, 
I have sort of a broader question, more related to conservation finance, but it does run, I think, to the potential for regionalizing uh, sources of capital. It's sort of an open question. Uh, in looking at what other products are doing in terms of trying to raise capital, one would be the historic tax credit as one one way of looking to raise capital from private sources and the low-income housing tax credit, another way. And I've, I've asked, uh, well, in the conservation area, where is a similar model where uh, a private firm can buy a tax credit to help uh, an institution or a farmer that doesn't have, isn't making any money? Because it really can't take advantage of this uh, 15 year, even the new program, if over 15 years, if they're not making any money, right. it's going to be hard to allow them to do so. So this other other types of models where you actually engage in a, in a partnership with a private corporation uh, or an individual or whatever, allows that person to, for a period of time, enter into an, an ownership agreement that sort of goes away when the, when the credit rolls off. You're probably familiar with Virginia and Colorado and their state tax credit program for conservation easements, which does exactly what you're talking about, which it allows someone who can uh, take the tax deduction, buy the credit, and it allows the farmer who can't take the donation um, sell the credit. And that's a you know, really powerful tool in getting land protected and meeting different needs and bringing new capital into the equation. It, it's pretty expensive for public entities to do that. And uh, there are people that have proposed uh, trying to do that kind of a transferable tax credit on a national scale. And, uh, and we've been part of helping to lobby for that. But it's, you know, the response you get is it's just, uh, you know, uh, such a heavy lift financially to the federal budget um, that it's just, you know, it's a tough thing to do as, as good an idea as it is. The conservation easement deduction enhancement that they're trying to pass right now that they extend year to year you know, they feel like it's a heavy lift already. But this tax credit thing is, you know, Colorado, I think, spends, you know, anywhere from 70 to 100 million on that a year. So it's a, I mean, in terms of lost revenue. So it's a, it's a big ticket item, but it is very powerful. And uh, I would love to see it expanded. Want to add to that, Jeff? I, I would, I was going to, I was thinking in exactly the same direction. One of the problems with Colorado and Virginia is there's been a lot of uh, misuse of those programs. And so it's not, it's not only expensive, it's difficult to administer so that people don't go out and build golf courses where they thought they were going to have something more natural. Um, so, so if there is a federal move to do that, I'm sure that the regulation of those markets will be something that's uh, discussed intensely. There's a second tool that's really interesting that's not so dissimilar that has to do with transferring tax credits from people who can't use them to people who can, called uh, new market tax credits that are used extensively in Maine. They're only available in census areas that are, I believe, in the bottom quartile income-wise of census areas in the United States. So they have to be in low-income places. Mm -hmm. But Coastal Enterprises <coughs> Inc. in Maine uh, has been very good about using these new market tax credits to buy forest land in Maine to revive mills in Maine to use the forest products coming off of those lands uh, and then selling the tax credits that are associated with that. And it's fairly complicated. There's some Lincoln articles about this uh, to, to banks and insurance companies and so on who can use the tax credits. So, so there is some financial engineering that's being done very creatively, uh, but it's limited to low income parts of the country. Let, let me recap a little of that and then a follow up and then uh, Stalin, I think we'll, we'll be out of time. So just very quickly, uh, Jim commented on the uh, Virginia and Colorado tax credit programs and noted there might have been some abuses there uh, and uh, uh, also mentioned the New Markets uh, tax credit program which can be used to combine conservation uh, objectives with economic development goals in low income communities. Uh, Bernie's going to say something but I want to uh, just mention a couple of resources that we haven't mentioned so far. Uh, we do have a policy-focused report on conservation easements that's worth taking a look at. These are all available on our website, by the way, for free download, or you can uh, buy a printed copy. Uh, Jim Levitt has edited a couple of books on conservation finance, which include a lot of specific 
uh, instruments that can be used to raise capital. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll once again note our policy focus report on large landscape conservation, which was put together by our partners at the University of Montana, uh, who are also the organizers of this practitioners network that will be starting here and continue to work in the crown of the continent, being you know, more or less in their backyard. It's, it's, it's the large landscape they've adopted uh, on our behalf, so we, we do have, uh, have a tie there as well. Uh, Bernie, do you want to say something? Uh, on the tax credit issue, we do have one in Massachusetts, and um, it is uh, it is not transferable in that sense. And the reason it's not transferable is because we took a look at Colorado and Virginia, and it's not just misuse; it was fraud. And frankly, we should have been helping to prosecute people in Colorado <laughs> rather than <laughs> rather than making excuses for them to the IRS. But the tax credit in Massachusetts would be. Um, it's a cash return. So if you don't have the ability to utilize the credit, the Commonwealth will cut you a check. That's it, in the amount of the tax credit So the, and the uh, easement donation. So that takes out the element of transferability because what was happening was some of these credits were getting kited from one entity to another and various things were happening. The credit isn't yet available in Massachusetts because we're waiting for both the Department of Revenue and the uh, Executive Office of Environmental Affairs to put their individual regulations So EEA has to do ecological certification of the properties, and DOR <coughs> has to figure out whatever it is DOR does with these things. It's, it's kind of new to them, but it's coming. Okay. It's law, it just the regs are not promulgated yet. When did it get passed into law? Hmm? When was it made a law? Uh, the governor signed it two years ago with the stipulation that it did not take effect until January of this year. And as far as we know, there aren't any farmers who can't use the checks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've learned that Massachusetts indeed has a new tax credit program for conservation, non-transferable, but possibly leading to checks actually being written to people, which uh, sounds like it might inspire them. Uh, so? Yeah, I just wanted to say one happy thing. As a fourth generation rancher in, in Northern California, uh, and the first one who put a, a conservation easement in, North Cal in, in Northern California, I was very happy. I was a graduate student at the, at the GSD when I, this was here because if Carpenter was after you with a gun, uh, that would break the, all the ranchers in my neighborhood were after me with a gun. But it can work. People have realized that it's the best way to preserve the land and to work together. And now we've reached a point where the state of California, the uh, California state, uh, the, uh, the Fish and Game, has realized that they have to manage their lands in a way that will work with this and work with the state. It's because it's just been fragmented and, and just a mess. But now, mm -hmm. under the uh, Wildlife Conservation Board and Tom Gibbon out there, uh, we're working together to try to make this happen. And there's a very open conversation throughout the state where people can, if they have a problem, and they have ideas, they can come. There's one source that's under Tom Gibbon's office, and we're trying to make the state work, the, the California Fish and Game lands, which are an enormous amount of land, and try to make this all work. And it does work. It takes a lot of pretentious, as I say, we're very happy that the four major landowners in Northern California all live within a block of each other in Beacon Hill. <laughs> 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 so it does work. Right, so, so we've heard another connection between uh, Massachusetts and uh, the great outdoors, uh, in this case, Northern California, and thank you for that. Uh, let's thank Jamie and all of you for your participation. Our, our last uh, official Lincoln Lecture of the season, so see you again when we, we do the next one, but we'll be back. Thanks.